Hello everybody and welcome to part 6. In this part we're mostly going to be looking at cameras, okay? So we're going to make a camera that follows the player around um, and is smooth and is dynamic and generally quite modular and useful for the rest of our game. It's going to very much follow the theme of uh, a camera's video I did quite recently um, in terms of like how it moves around and how it behaves. Um, so sorry if you've seen that video and most of this is a bit copy paste for you, but we might look into some other stuff as well and we'll probably learn some things along the way that are specifically relevant to this uh, game rather than just uh, that more all-purpose tutorial. So, um, you'll notice I've changed a few things in here. The room is a lot bigger. I just went into properties here, made the room bigger in width and height um, and moved the walls around a bit just so that we have an area to sort of demonstrate our camera actually working, right? Um, and a little area here where we can climb up just to see the sort of vertical uh, movement going on as well. Um, but that's all I've really changed in here. Uh, one thing you will need to do though, as part of this, um, as part of just the setup for all this, is go to Viewports and Cameras. By default, all this stuff will just be turned off and tick Enable Viewports, okay? Make sure that's ticked. And then Viewport 0, because you have up to seven of these viewports, uh, tick Visible, okay? And you'll get this white rectangle that appears. Um, don't worry about the fact that it's just off in the middle of nowhere because we're going to control that ourselves through code. Okay, uh, all the default settings are here are fine, otherwise you just make sure it's enabled and that this is visible. We'll make an object to handle pretty much everything else. Okay, so with all that stuff set up, let's create a new object now. I'm going to call it O camera. Okay, and we're not going to assign a sprite, it's just going to be an invisible object. And something I'm going to do is my preferred way to kind of work with objects most of the time now, unless I'm doing something quick, in which case the workspace is fine. Um, I like having full screen code. So what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna add the two events that we need, which is the create event and the step event. Oh, and one thing before I do this, you'll notice that they've got a little question mark on the end now, and that's because I've got this triple slash at description question mark as my default uh, comment. Uh, you can set a default comment so that whenever you create an event, it adds that comment in at the start. It starts off and by default as some little help thing like write your code here or whatever, which isn't super useful. But I've changed it to be three slashes and at description and question mark, which means um, what this section does, just the at description, set it up so the whatever you type afterwards becomes the description of that event's script, okay? And it labels it here in the events thing in the workspace, which can be quite handy. So in the create event, I'm going to call this one... Um, Set up camera and uh, in the step event I'm going to call it update camera because it's updating the camera in the camera position pretty straightforward right and it just tells you that create set up camera step update camera which is kind of handy okay now that we've created those two events though um, I'm going to do away with using the workspace because I don't really need to touch any of this stuff anymore I've got the two events I'm going to need I don't need any other events for this uh, particular object so what I'm going to do is I'm going to minimize first of all the room editor section definitely don't need that uh, close this down, even though it doesn't really matter, I can close the whole workspace actually. I'm going to right click in camera and select open all event scripts, okay? And what that's done is it's opened up full screen um, our create event and our step event for our camera. So we've got a tab for our o camera events and two tabs that are our two uh, events that we created, which is just a really cool, easy way of working on the scripts, uh, of keeping it full screen without having to like maximize and minimize each time and find the next thing. Okay, it's just keeping them there, and then we can just keep coming back to this tab whenever we want to work on our camera. Okay, so that's all our setup done. Let's actually get down to some code, right? Um, so setting up the camera. So this is the create event. Make sure you got that right. So I labeled these pretty similarly, so it'd be easy to mess them up, I guess. So make sure create event tab. Um, cam equals view camera uh, open square bracket zero close square bracket okay uh, view camera zero is going to return the camera that will be created by default by game maker for um, for this viewport now that we've enabled the viewport now that we turn viewport zero on um, a camera will be created that's designed to capture this kind of rectangular view here uh, this is really useful because it saves us having to um, create a camera manually and use matrices and all that stuff um, that you may have learned about if you watched my other video that explains sort of how the new camera system works. Um, this lets us work with it a lot more like how GameMix Studio 1.x used cameras, which is a lot more simple and straightforward and is all we really need for now. Uh, for a basic 2D camera and everything, we don't really need any of the advanced stuff that the new camera system offers at all. So we're just going to use the basic stuff. So by just turning it on the ID there and um, 
it allows us to use things like view camera zero, which gets us the ID of the camera that this has created. And you'll see how it lets us move around the camera really easily later on as well. So let's minimize this again now. Um, the next variable I want is follow, and I'm going to set that to equal O player. Okay, and this is just going to contain the ID at any point of whatever object we want the camera to be following. The reason we set that as a variable is so that we can change it later on. So we can change it so, I don't know, maybe follow, have the camera follow enemies around or do anything dynamic. Maybe if we're doing a cutscene and we want it to focus in on like a, uh, a particular entity in the world or whatever. We can just set follow from the camera to that and then the camera will zoom to that thing. Uh, you'll notice I've put the name of the object in here. Um, if we had multiple player objects for whatever reason, this obviously wouldn't be what we wanted to do. We'd want to get the exact ID of the one we want. If you type an object name into something, what it'll do is it'll return the ID of the oldest instance of that object. Uh, because we've only got one, it doesn't matter. Okay, so it'll just return that one. And that functionality could like change at any point in time. So really the only time you ever want to use the name of an object is if you only have one of that one instance of that object, okay, as a way of returning its ID. Um, a lot of the time you probably want to check that uh, an instance of it existed as well before doing that, but that won't be too much of a problem for us, we'll, as you'll see later on. Um, okay, the next variable I want in here is going to be view w half, okay, and what this means is I'm going to get, because of the way we'll be manipulating our camera position, um, it's going to be based on the, the view rectangle and the x, y position of the this view here, this rectangle, is the top left. Um, so we're going to want it centered on our player though, so that's going to mean we're going to want to know uh, in order to adjust appropriately what half of this distance is and what half of this distance is, okay? So it's half of the view width and half of the view height. Um, let's come back and here now. So view w half, we can get that very easily. Um, this is another function that we can only use with views created from the ID in the way that we've done. Camera get view width. Okay, so because we know that rectangle, we can work out the width. I'm typing cam because that's the, the ID of the camera that we want, the camera on viewport zero, and just multiply it by 0 0.5 to get half of it. Or divide by two, whichever you'd prefer, I guess. Um, the other thing is obviously view h half, which is going to be the same. Camera get view height cam times 0.5 okay doke uh, the last two variables we're going to need are x2 equals x start and y2 equals y start x2 and y2 are going to represent the x and y coordinate that we're moving towards at any point in time so they're going to get updated to be like our player's x coordinate and our player's y coordinate that's the the x we're moving to and the y we're moving to that's how i've decided to name those variables. I just always name it that way. I don't know why. Just, that's the way I name it. Um, and by setting it to x start and y start, what this means is our original destination for the camera will be wherever the camera starts, okay? Which allows you to sort of manipulate the starting position of the camera just by wherever you happen to place the instance in the room, because that's the thing you always have to remember to do. You have to remember to actually place the camera somewhere. Or even if you create it dynamically, it would just... Wherever the camera starts, um, that's where it's initial destination would be. I suppose what you could always do as well, type x, x, and y. Um, in the, since it's in the create event, that works just the same. Um, doesn't really make too much of a difference. But x, and y, x start and y start, they're kind of useful variables if um, um, throughout like step events and stuff like that because they return uh, your original x position and your original y position. Um, since that's what I was after, that's what made me think to use those. Although, yeah, it doesn't actually make, you could just use X and Y. It doesn't really make any difference. But I've used this now, so we'll go with it. Okay, um, that's everything for the create event. That's all the setup we need. Um, those six variables, make sure you've got those and we'll move on. Okay, so coming over into our step event now, this is where all the real magic happens, right? So this is where we're updating the camera. So first of all, we're gonna update destination. Okay, so we remember our x2 and our y2. This is where we're going to decide what that should be. Um, basically, wherever our player is at the point in time, but more specifically, wherever the instance that's been assigned to follow, which as you remember, is our player. So first of all, we want to check that whatever ID we've put into follow is an instance that actually exists in the world. So say our player's been killed or something like that. 
we don't want to try and set our destination to the x and y coordinate of an instance that doesn't exist, otherwise we'll probably get an error. So if instance underscore exists, uh, open bracket and then the name of the object, and that will return true if uh, at least one of these exists in the room, um, or it'll return false if there are none, okay? So assuming it's true, assuming uh, our play, oh no, it shouldn't be player, sorry, it should be follow. So assuming the instance ID or the object ID or whatever that we point to follow, which is O player, assuming one of those exists, okay? Um, or assuming that exact instance exists, rather. Um, assuming it does, we do the following. x2 is going to equal follow dot x, and y2 is going to equal follow dot y. And that's just going to take that ID, um, and by doing dot x and dot y, it reaches into that instance ID and looks for this feature. So it looks for, see if it's got an x coordinate, if it has it, returns it, if it, see if it's got y, it'll return it. If it doesn't, it'll probably throw up error. Um, but uh, assuming follow exists, which we know it does because we've already checked, it'll get us an x and a y and it'll put it into x2 and y2, which is where we want to go. Next thing we want to do is actually, now that we know where we want to go, let's move towards that position. So I update uh, object position, I guess. Well, this is where we actually want to manipulate our own x and y position of the camera, okay? So x plus equals, because what this object is going to do, I haven't really explained already, um, this object is going to move around and this object is going to represent uh, where the camera should be, okay? So we're going to set the x and y position of this camera object to be somewhere and then we'll move that view rectangle to be wherever O camera is, okay? Oh, I don't want to open it in there, let's go. Um, so let's maximize that again. So x plus equals, which means that we're adding to x. I don't think I've done this before, actually. If I haven't, uh, I usually do like x equals x plus something. Uh, by typing x plus equals or even x minus equals, uh, if I said 2 on the end of there, that just adds 2 to x. If I do minus equals, that would subtract 2 from x. Okay, it's so just a quicker way of doing add, add this value to this value or subtract this value from this value. Uh, rather than having to do like x equals x minus 2 or whatever, okay? It's just another way of writing that. So x plus equals, and then open bracket, x2 minus x divided by 25. And y plus equals y2 minus y divided by 25. So, whoa, whoa, what on earth have I done there? Well, we've got the position that we want to move to, subtracting the position that we're currently at, and then dividing by 25. All it does is it gives us the difference between um, where we want to be and where we currently are. So say x2 is to the left of us, like, and it was at 200, and our current x position was 400. 400 minus, um, uh, 200 minus 400 is negative 200, right? So that means we want to add negative 200, which uh, is moving us in the left direction because it's negative. But then we divide it by 25. So what this ends up doing is moving as 1 25th of the distance between our current position and the position that we want to be in. Okay, very, very simple. Um, what that does is it allows the camera to move really smoothly rather than snap to the position that we want it to be in. Um, and that position, that distance gets smaller and smaller and smaller as we get closer, because like, as, the, as you get closer, obviously the, the distance, the difference is smaller and then it's dividing by a smaller the value so it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, which makes the camera move really smoothly, okay? So it moves fast when it's far away, and then slows to a halt when it actually approaches its final destination, which is what we want. Really simple way of doing that without really doing anything too fancy, just some simple maths. Okay, now once we've done that, um, we just need to update the camera's actual position. So I'm going to do update camera view as the comment for this bit, and camera underscore set view pause. Okay, this is a function that we can only use again if we're using um, a, a uh, one of these rectangles, okay, if we're using one of this uh, these views that we set up in the IDE. If we set up a camera manually, we obviously don't have a view rectangle that we can just easily manipulate. We actually have to just manipulate the camera position and the lens and all that. Whereas, since we set it up in there, we've got some simple functions we can use, and this is one of them. Uh, just literally sets the top left of that rectangle to be somewhere, and then that's the view you're going to get in your viewport. I can just type cam here because that's the camera that we want to use. That's what we got in the create event, view camera zero. 
and then the x and y position we want is basically just x and y. It's not exactly though, it's as we talked about before, that x and y and the, the view pause we're setting here is the top left. And we don't want to set the top left to be aiming for basically where the player is, right? Because that will just put the player in the top left of the camera, which is not what we want. So we want to use those variables that we created at the beginning, view w half and view h half, and we want to subtract those from the x and y. So if we type x minus view w half, I'm sure it turns blue, so it's the exact same name as the variable you wrote, view h half for the y position. So that would basically puts our x and y on the player, but then moves the actual camera um, half of the by by half of this distance to the to the left and by half of this distance up, meaning the player is left in the center rather than in the top left of the camera. Okay, and it means this basically position is always always making it so that the the camera object wherever we put it in the room and we should put it in the room now actually um, will always be in the center there. So. I'm going to put it on the player layer, so make sure you select the player layer. Um, I don't think we really need a separate layer for the camera, uh, since it's not like drawing anything to the screen, its depth isn't really important. And just put it anywhere really. Um, where you put it kind of matters because it determines where the camera is originally going to start, so actually let's plot it over here or something like that, okay? Um, determines yeah, where that original camera position uh, uh, starts off. Um, obviously it will get magnetized towards the player immediately. We'll probably see that happen. So if I run the game now, now that I've put that in the room, we should see, yeah, you can see it sort of shifted a bit at the start here. You can see we've now got a camera that follows our player and you can see it's kind of smooth as well because as I say, it moves faster when it's further away from its destination and slower once it finally closes in. You'll notice as well, when I come over here, you can see this little square here. We can actually, and that's just to prove if I show you the room editor, that we can actually see quite far outside of the room with this camera at the moment, which you may want. You may want to do it that way. It's a, it depends how you're doing your game. If you want to be able to see outside the room, that's fine. But um, I'm going to show you next how to make it so that the camera clamps to the borders of your room, okay? Uh, because by manipulating the view directly in this way, um, there's nothing to stop it from going outside the room. So uh, in between where we update the object position and where we actually update the final camera view, uh, since we know where the camera actually is, we can now take that value and clamp it to be a position that we know is going to be fixed inside the room. Okay, I'm going to type x equals clamp, open bracket, x, and then comment. As you can see at the bottom here, clamp takes a minimum value and a maximum value. And what it does is it just makes sure that uh, the value that we put in in the first place um, is a value between those two values. So if it goes below the minimum, it sets it to the minimum. If it goes over the maximum, it sets it to the maximum. Okay, really useful little function. Um, and we want to clamp it to uh, left and right of the room plus half of the view width and uh, half of the view height for y. So x is horizontal, so we want it to clamp between not here, because that, remember, this is the center position of the camera, but like more or less around here, okay, which is half of this view width. And when it's on this side, we want it to not be here, but about sort of like here, okay? Uh, which we can do very easily because we have those, uh, because we have the, the view width and view height, half of those in the, these variables. So I can get that just from typing, um, well, I mean, x position on the far left of the room is zero, so I don't need to type anything there, but view w half. So zero, because obviously we don't need to add zero plus or anything like that, because it's just zero plus view w half is going to give us this position here, roughly x, y's. And uh, then all we need to do uh, is type room width to get the, the far right of the room and subtract view w half from that. Okay, and that'll clamp our x position to be correct x and y. In fact, I can just run that now by itself before we do the y component of that. And you can see now we can't see that square on the side anymore, but if I do move all the way here, we can see the camera still moves like that. But when I get to the far right here, you can see the camera stops moving like that and it doesn't let us go outside of the room anymore.
And then we can do the exact same thing in the y direction. So we're doing y equals clamp, y, uh, our minimum being view h half, so zero plus like half of the, of the view height. And then room height, um, so right at the bottom of the room, subtract view h half minus half of that view height. Okay, run that. And that, as you can see, has clamped it so that we don't go underneath the room anymore. But as you can see, when I jump up here, view height still camera still moves up with us. It just doesn't move out the bottom of the screen anymore. Okay, so that's how you do simple camera stuff. That's how you're doing a camera that moves very smoothly, very, very useful. And what we can do with this now, because we've set it up with this follow thing, is if I just change this follow, I can just make it follow like one of the enemies by doing that. Um, or I could even make it follow the bullets if I wanted to. So you can see now it's following like just one of the enemies around as it's just on its little patrol. I've still got control of the player and everything. You can see him just sort of jumping around here. Uh, <laughs> oh, and by killing him there as well, that's obviously made it to the camera. Oh, no, no, I didn't kill him. That's the one, isn't it? Yeah. So if I kill... Oh, no, if, yeah, if I kill it, it actually moves between. <laughs> that's kind of interesting <laughs> because obviously it's going to keep returning the, um, the oldest ID there. That's kind of interesting. Cool. So uh, that's how you do a cool... Uh, simple smooth camera and just by changing follow around if we could do dynamically in the code we could make the camera move to various different objects. Bonus section! So we're gonna add our tile set into the game as well just to start prettying it up a little bit because we're all probably a bit sick of just these little grey boxes around the place and next part we'll probably also look at doing some parallax backgrounds and stuff just to really get it looking like a proper game rather than just sort of that weird empty blue background that we've got going on. So I'm going to bring in this tile set that I've created. Um, you see it's arranged in a particular way and you can probably work it out or it'll make more sense when I start placing it earlier, all the different inside corners and stuff like that. Um, it's a 48 or 47 or however it is, um, whether you count the, the blank one or not, uh, tile tile set. Um, arranged in a very specific order, okay? And you'll want to arrange, if you make a tile set for uh, Game Maker Studio 2 and you want to use the auto tiling feature um, you want to make sure you've kind of arranged it in this specific order if you're doing a 48 tile uh, tile set that covers all the various different inside corners and stuff like that and you'll see why in a second so here's my tile set and I'll include this in the resources so you can download it and use it if you want I'd rather you didn't use it if you were making like a project that you were going to use commercially or sell or whatever but you feel free to use it for learning and stuff, and it's not really the biggest deal in the world. It's just, you know, people will notice that you've used the asset from a tutorial, and it'll, it won't look good for you. So try not to use it for stuff like that, okay? But uh, feel free to use it if you're just learning and you just want to make something that looks kind of pretty. Um, Right-click in tile sets. I'm going to hit create, and I'm going to call it T tiles, because sure, normally I'd give it a more descriptive name than that, but we're just going to have the one tile set. Assign the sprite to be as tiles. So there we go, we bring that in there. You can see it's too small at the moment. The, the rectangles are too small for the tiles we want. These are 32 by 32. So type 32 and 32. You can see that split that up properly there. And you'll notice that the top left one doesn't have a rectangle around it. You always need the top left of your sprite, your original sprite that you're working from, to be a blank tile when you're making a tile set, okay? So make sure that you do that. Then this isn't me finished. I mean, I could go into the room editor now and start placing these, but I'm going to make it may way easier for myself by going into the auto tiling section. Okay. So here I can define an auto tile template that allows me to use this tile set in Game Maker to just sort of paint uh, a brush uh, around the room and have it automatically decide what tiles should be where. Okay. So you can see a 47 and a 16. You can use a, a 16 tile set or a, a 47 tile tile set. This one's 47. So I'm going to add that. You can see this setup comes up, and basically we have to select each corner and each um, like type of tile. So like which ones looks like the upper floor, which ones like the side wall, which ones like a corner here, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is why I've set it up in this particular way. Okay, because this allows us to just straight up click on everything that we need. Um, other than this top left one here, which is like a full tile, um, that's the bottom bottom right tile in my, my template in my order. Everything else you can probably already see it lines up perfectly with this. So all I have to do is click each tile at a time 
And this is the fastest way I found of setting this up. Otherwise you have to do it by eye and you might get something wrong and so on if you've done it in kind of a random order. So try and do it in the order that Game Maker gives you. If you want, you can use this tile set I've done as a template. It's not the best template in the world because some of the tiles are hard to distinguish from one another. Um, I might upload um, an actual template you can use with this. In fact, yeah, I've made one before, so I'll put that in the description. Uh, I have a, a, an actual template that looks a lot more like the, um, the, the template you saw originally at the start here with just like the block and square and stuff like that, that you can draw on top of as a way of uh, creating your own tile set if you want to. But uh, once I created this called Auto Tile One, you can probably rename that. Um, just call it Auto Tile. I don't know. I don't really have a specific name I need to give it. So uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, we can close that now. Um, I don't really need to close any of this. I just go into the room editor really now. And I'm going to create a tile layer. I'm going to create it above our wall layer. In fact, I think I need to move the wall because I think they're. Uh, I think these walls are all kind of offset from the grid a little from when I was moving them earlier. So if I just select them all and shift them, just so that they're properly lined up like that with the grid, because um, we're going to need them to be for this. And then on the tile layer, I'll just call it tiles. We're not, we're not going to have more than one tile layer, so that's fine. Um, and select T tiles as our tile set. And then over here, you'll notice in the room editor tab, you've got uh, tiles that I, so I can place. Um, if I zoom in, I can like place this tile kind of around the room, but we've set up our auto tiles. So how do we use that? Um, I'm just going to zoom to exact one to one with the equals button there. Go to libraries. And you see auto tile library. You can select auto tiles, the one we created. And now you can see it's got this little island here. If I just drag this out, you can see I can just start to paint this tile around, which is awesome. So I'm going to just start painting that over the top of our wall objects where we've got those okay in fact what i'll do is i'll move this layer below walls so we can kind of see um actually i'll leave it above while we're doing it so we can see where we're where we're drawing on like that what you might want to do if you're using wall objects is like make the wall object semi-transparent and i might do that in a second and then place it above so you can kind of see both at once um so if I go into S wall here and I just like, if I delete this, set the paint thing, set the alpha down to like, I don't know, 87 or something like that. Um, we'll make it like a blue color or something actually. Uh, oh, set the alpha. And there we go. Like that. And then in the wall object itself, untick visible so that when you actually run the game, you won't be able to see the walls. You'll still collide with them properly. Um, and then I can move the wall layer above tiles like that so we can see both. Um, but the blue itself won't actually show up in the game, which will be great. So, and if we want to turn it off while we're, we're editing, we can do that as well. Um, I suppose I can delete this one now as well. So let's go into the tile layer now and let's just continue drawing around the outside of here as well. Since we can't ever get through here, so it doesn't matter to the player that this technically isn't solid space. We can just make it look like it is and saves us actually putting a million objects um, so you can see where we've added some objects over the top of one another there as well. That might be something you want to clean up if you've accidentally done that. Uh, helpful aspect of making them a bit transparent. Uh, we'll stretch this all the way up here as well. Why not? Even though there's technically no collision there. Doesn't really matter. Um, so now, I mean, you can see it if I, I don't take that as well. You can see... We've got a little bit of a prettier landscape to walk around. It looks a bit Minecraft-esque, actually. This oh, I've still got the camera following around the enemy sprite. It's kind of neat. Um, you can see now we've got a bit of a prettier, prettier world. Um, just a simple way of adding your tile set and how to use auto tiling as a little bonus thing at the end. There, just to sort of fill out the rest of this video. Next week, we're probably going to be looking. Not next week, sorry. Next part, um, which might not be for a little while because I've got um, I've got a Patreon video to do and a um also doing some freelance work so it might be a little bit longer than two weeks for the next one but we'll see how it goes it might not be you might still get it in two weeks we'll see how everything pans out but the next part either way is probably going to look at we're going to do some parallax background stuff and um and then if we've got some more time we'll probably do some more stuff as well from there but i don't want to spoil it all so uh you'll have to wait and see i'll see you guys next time Shout out as always to my awesome Patreon supporters without whom none of this work would really be possible. Shout outs in no particular order, but in particular to 
Dan, Inner Mule, Alex Ray, Giles Montgomery, Angel Rodriguez, Harold Guidry, Roxon, Nathaniel Walsh, Lewis Pereira, Stephen Hagen, Jason McMillan, Owen Morgan, and Bowser the Dog. Thank you very, very much for your continued support. And of course, thank you for watching this video. If you like what I do, I make new videos basically every Friday. So you can click subscribe, tick the bell, and it'll tell you exactly when I do what I do. If you really, really like what I do, and you'd want to be one of these cool kids who get to decide what topics I cover, you can hop over to patreon.com forward slash seanjs, or just click on my face over to the left. It'll be there anytime now. Thanks for watching. Catch you guys next time.